So we know that energy is the capacity to cause change. Now we can cause change in a lot of different ways. And in this class, we're going to focus on four main ways to express that energy. Um, we just call them energy types, just to make it really easy. Uh, they're going to be energy of location, energy of movement, energy of deformed objects, and energy which is no longer useful. So for each of those four, I'll try to give you an example of when uh, we would see that kind of energy. And you're also going to see me derive for you an algebraic expression that we can use in problem solving in order to meet our goal, whether it's to find how high something goes or how fast something moves or whatever it may be. Now, you will not be responsible for these derivations. I'm just doing them so that you know exactly where these equations came from. The thing that you are going to be responsible for is the equation that we put into the red box for each of these four different types of energy. That is what we will use in problem solving, and that's what I'm going to be asking you to know later. So uh, let's start with this first type. It is energy of location. This one's pretty easy to understand because if we have something that's higher than something else, we would expect that it would be able to cause a greater amount of change, right? For example, this blue skier, he has more energy because he's at a greater height. So this energy of location is what we would call gravitational energy. And if I wanted to come up with a way that I could calculate the gravitational energy of something, well, I can do that using what we learned from our lab. We know that for a force versus displacement graph, the area of that graph is going to tell me something about the energy. So for gravitational energy, I'm going to be looking at a graph of the force of gravity, since it is the force of gravity that would help to cause this change, versus delta y, because moving uh, laterally won't change the amount of energy that I have. However, moving up and down will totally change the amount of gravitational energy that I have. And for ease of this derivation, we're going to assume that we are very close to the Earth. And so we can assume that no matter how high you go, our force of gravity is going to stay the same the entire time. So that gives us this rectangle. And if we can calculate the area of this rectangle, well, then we will have calculated the gravitational energy in that object. So we know that to calculate the area of a rectangle, we just need to do base times height. So that would be Fg times delta y. And we have an equation for Fg as long as we are close to the surface of the Earth, right? It's 9.8 newtons per kilogram times your mass. So this gravitational energy equation is 9.8 newtons per kilogram times mass times delta y. And as long as you can calculate that, you have calculated the gravitational energy of an object. Another kind of energy we have is the energy of movement. And that kind of makes sense, right? When you think of the old tortoise and the hare uh, fable, we certainly know that the hair moves a lot faster, and so it's pretty easy to say, well, that hair must have a lot more energy. So for energy of movement, in order to move, or at least to start moving, we need to apply a net force. And we will then move some displacement. Now we're going to assume that no matter how far you move, you have the same net force acting on you. And so yet again, we are going to try to find the area of this rectangular shape. And the area of this rectangular shape should tell us what this energy of movement is. And by the way, most people are going to call energy of movement kinetic energy. Kinetic, you know, it has that Latin prefix, you know, K-I-N, it's all about movement, 
So that's another way to kind of remember that energy of movement is kinetic energy. Anywho, so for kinetic energy, we are going to do base times height, again, to find the area of that rectangle. So that would be net force times delta x. And Newton's second law tells us that net force is the same thing as ma. So another way we could write that is ma times delta x. But I would have to know a whole lot. Um, I'd have to know, have three things that I knew, and that's so rare. We know that in physics, we hardly ever know three things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you guys think way back to first semester when we did kinematics. And we had our equation Vf squared equals Vi squared plus 2A delta x. Okay, we got that that A delta X right there, and there's an A delta X in our kinetic energy equation. So let's try to maybe do a little bit of substitution and make this kinetic energy equation a little bit prettier. And we'll start by assuming that our initial velocity was always zero. So that way we can divide the two to the other side and we get one half V squared equals A delta X. We now will substitute that in and get that the kinetic energy is one half mv squared, which is actually not all that bad. That's going to be pretty easy. And so as long as you know the mass of an object and how fast it is moving, then you should be able to calculate the kinetic energy of that object. Now let's turn the page. And start looking at energy within deformed objects. This is actually what you guys did in your lab. So we're already very familiar with energy within deformed objects, right? There was some force that we needed uh, to exert, and we had our spring stretch a certain um, amount of stretch. But you know, this doesn't have to just apply to springs. Energy within deformed objects can apply um, to rubber bands, it can apply to balloons, it can really apply to anything where you can change the shape of that object and then by itself the object returns to its original shape. So springs, rubber bands, poppers, um, balloons, but not something like clay. If you change the shape of clay, the clay will not spontaneously go back to its original shape. So we, so energy within deformed objects has that one specific criteria. Now we know the shape of this graph from our lab. It looked like this. And so as long as we can find uh, the area of this shape, which it's a little bit more difficult than the previous two because this is going to be a trapezoid. We should be able to figure this out. Now, uh, if we look at this, we've got some kind of initial stretch. We've got some kind of final stretch. Uh, we've got some kind of initial force. And then we've got a final force. Those are all going to come in to this equation for um, spring energy, because that's what energy de within deformed objects is commonly called. It's commonly called spring, or maybe sometimes elastic energy. You're going to hear me call it spring energy. So, for a trapezoid, uh, the equation for a trapezoid is one half times uh, the height of the trapezoid, which for us is xf minus xi, times base 1 plus base 2. So base 1 is fi, and base 2 is ff. And this is a ton of stuff that we have to know. We have to know the initial stretch, we have to know the final stretch, we have to know the initial amount of force that we're applying, we have to know the final amount of force that we're applying. And that's really unrealistic for us to know all of that. But we do know that this uh, line has the equation F equals KX, right? Because that's the equation that we got from your lab. 
where k represents the spring constant, which is the stretchiness of the spring. So what we can do is we can keep those x's, but instead of having these forces, let's instead write them as kxi plus kxf. So now it is only the stretch that we need to know in order to calculate how much energy there is in this spring or rubber band or whatever. So we need to make this look a little bit prettier. Um, we'll take that spring constant and we'll pull it out front. And we're left with 1 half kxf minus xi times xi plus xf. So what we can do with all of this stuff in the parentheses is everybody's favorite math function. We can FOIL all of it. Now I'll spare you actually writing out all of the FOIL. But what we end up with the, in the end is spring energy is equal to 1 half times the spring constant times xf squared minus xi squared. That's what that FOIL boils down to. And this is what we shall use whenever we want to calculate how much energy there is in a spring or a rubber band or a popper or anything like that. Now one thing to know is that um, the the uh, stretch, please make sure that you square both of them and then subtract them. Uh, if we subtract first and then square, we will not get the same answer and it will be incorrect. So remember to square first and then subtract from each other. All right, lastly, we have energy which is no longer useful. Now this is commonly called dissipated energy. Now this dissipated energy we see around us all the time. In fact, I'm dissipating energy right now talking to you because dissipated energy can be expressed as heat or as sound. It's essentially dissipated energy is anything that um, we cannot recapture and transform into a different kind of energy, right? If we uh, have something that is up high, we know that it has gravitational energy, but as soon as we let it go, it comes back down to Earth, it will be moving, it has kinetic energy. Uh, but once energy becomes heat or light or sound, we cannot take that sound and make it move something, or we cannot make that take that sound and and make it where it brings something up high or it stretches a rubber band. So since that energy cannot become any other kind of energy, we just say that it has contributed to the entropy of the universe and it has been dissipated. Now we can calculate one specific kind of dissipated energy, and that's the dissipated energy caused by friction. So if you uh, are rubbing your hands together, you'll notice that they will get warm, right? And that's heat, and you have now used friction to dissipate some energy. Now, if we... Um, we find the area of this force of friction versus x graph, we can find out what that dissipated energy is. Okay, so E dis will equal the force of friction times the distance, not the displacement, but the distance that the object has moved. And we're not going to change this, we're just going to keep it right as it is. Okay, so now that we've learned these four equations, let's do two really, really fast example problems just to make sure that we are comfortable with using them. So a bungee cord stretches 25 meters and has a spring constant of 140 newtons per meter. How much energy is stored in the bungee? Well, if we are stretching a bungee cord, then we have spring energy. So we'll use the equation 1 half K times XF squared minus XI squared. And luckily, they give us basically everything 
everything we need to know. They tell us that the K is 100 newtons per meter. They tell us the stretch is 25 meters. Uh, we can assume that it has an initial stretch of zero. And when we punch that into our calculator, we get that the um, spring energy is 43,750 joules. So that wasn't too bad. That was very plug and chug just making sure that we are comfortable with the equation. Now let's go to exercise two. How fast does a 50 gram arrow need to travel to have 40 joules of kinetic energy? So they've already told us that we're thinking about kinetic energy, so we'll use 1 half mv squared. Uh, the kinetic energy is 40 joules, so we'll put that in. Uh, and the mass is 50 grams which we must convert into kilograms. Please, please, please remember that we always work in kilograms, meters, and seconds. But yet again, we're just left with a little bit of algebra, and I know that you all are so fabulous at algebra, and I'm sure that we all got that our velocity for this arrow is 40 meters per second.